Welcome back. This is the Tutor Wizard. I'm Adrian. Please subscribe right here. Hit the notification bell. You'll get uh, notifications for this series and a bunch of others on our channel. We're doing linear algebra one. This is chapter one, systems of linear equations. We talk at first about nonlinear equations, but those are the fun ones. Right now, what we're going to do is we're going to step it up one now from last time we did one equation in one unknown. Section 1.3 is now going to be one equation in as many unknowns as you want. So we'll start with two and then just point out that there's always infinitely many solutions or so you can't really get a contradiction if there's only one equation. This lecture specifically, what we're going to do is the general solution to equations containing n unknowns instead of just one. One equation in two unknowns. Now what we're going to do is still consider a single equation, but what happens if we get more unknown variables? Right now what we'll do is deal with two, and then you'll see that for all intents and purposes, the scenario doesn't really change when we add a third variable y, or then when we have to start indexing and using x1, x2, x3, x4. If we group these together as we did before, we group the x terms together, group all the y terms together, group all the constant terms together, this is going to give us a general form of a uh, one equation and two unknowns. In most cases, we're going to be trying to make it simplistic. So when we talk about one by two or two by two or three by two systems, you'll understand what that terminology means in the next video. Once we start doing that, we are going to either make it look like this, and for simplicity, just call the constants A, B, C, and our two variables X and Y. But right away, for convenience, you'll see we want to index stuff and have information in there, and we're going to start making it look like this. So in general, it's going to look like A11X1 plus A12X2 equals B1. What does that say? Here's the color code. This is actually now, those were all the same because it was the equation one, because there is only one. We're going to get more eventually, <laughs> as many as you want. You're like, one's good. And then the second index, oh, I dipped twice. What? The second index is always going to tell you the variable you have. So the second index, which I've labeled red now, is going to be variable one and variable two. So, or the column eventually we're gonna say that you're in. What this tells us now is we're gonna start wanting to, in larger systems, start keeping track of the row we're in or the equation we're in and the variable that we're talking about. So we double index these coefficients. That was a long story of saying that we're gonna start double indexing constants except for this one and then we're going to call them x1 and x2 instead of x and y. Now let's look at how we solve this and what's the solution to one equation and two unknowns. Okay, solving one equation in two unknowns. Again, Eventually, and I think two videos from now, I will give all of these definitions in a couple scenes about what the definition of a, here's a system of equations and what does it mean to be a linear system of equations, what it would mean to be a solution of a system of linear equations, but we don't have quite the full picture. So for now, a solution is any now. It's going to be, we're going to start using the terminology ordered pair, but what we're now going to do is the first time we were doing it, we were just looking for any real number that would make the equation ax equals b true. Now what we're going to do is we have a second variable in there and a solution is going to mean that we're going to look for which we call r2 is r cross r. That means that x has to be a real number and y has to be a real number and we're looking for simultaneous ordered pairs now x and y which when I take them as the ordered pair piece of information and I put them both into here now it makes the statement true. Last time I only needed one guy to make it true. Now for one equation and two unknowns, I need this ordered pair when I put them in there to make this statement true. How are we going to get that? Now what we're going to see is there will never be a unique solution in this scenario. And immediately we had that A is not zero and B is not zero. Why is this? Because otherwise it was written in the last scene, but I forgot to point it out. So I'll point it out right now. These have to be non-zero right out the gate because if a is not zero then I have one equation and one unknown and if b is not or if b is zero then again I have one equation and one unknown so to have two unknowns I can assume that a and b are not zero what we're going to do is to solve this we're not going to have enough information to solve for both x and y in one equation therefore what we have to do is make one of them a free variable and then solve for the other guy and say we have infinitely many solutions in this scenario, the first time for pedagogical reasons, I'll do it the way that you've seen it before, where we make y the dependent variable and x the independent variable. What we're gonna do is solve for y in this equation. That's gonna give me 
by equals what you do to one side, you do the other. So we're going to subtract ax from both sides. That's going to give me c minus ax. And what I'm going to do is b is not zero because I've assumed it. So I can multiply both sides by one over b. And that's going to give me y is equal to one over b c minus ax which is using distributive properties of the axioms of the real numbers. This gives me y is negative a over bx plus c over b when you clean that up. That is why I did that. Let's call that a big B then. This is y equals mx plus b form or the slope intercept form of a straight line in the plane. So geometrically what this is saying is now, depending on your slope, in this case it may be negative. Just because it's there doesn't mean this thing is negative. But what that says is any ordered pair x, y on this line is a solution to this equation. So geometrically, solutions to this equation, ordered pairs, are points on this line. And now what we're going to do is, it'll be confusing at first, but once we get systems of equations, this will make much more sense to switch to check calling it a variable. The solutions to this now, you can't just say that solve for y in terms of x or vice versa, which I'm going to do in the second version, which is what, actually what we're going to do in general. What you now have to do is list all of the solutions to this equation. And that means that we're going to let x be free. Why can't x just be x and r? Well, you'll see when it gets more complicated. And then what we're going to say is, because x is free to be anything, y is now equal to negative a over b t, because x is t plus c over b. And this is the infinitely many solutions to this equation. There can't be also a contradiction with one equation with itself, and there can't be a unique solution. So if you have one equation and two unknowns, there always has to be infinitely many solutions. And then it's going to be the same story if you add more variables, y and w, and as many as you want. There can't be a unique solution to when you have more unknowns than equations, you can't have a unique solution. You could have a contradiction once we get more equations, but we don't have more equations, so infinitely many solutions. Every point on this line is a solution to our equation. Now let's solve it in for x in terms of y, because that's the game we're going to play in general. All right, quickly, we're going to try version 2 for larger systems. What we're going to do is not what you just saw. Usually we're not going to call it x and y's. We're going to call it all this indexing business. We're going to call them... Again, double indexing for the constants, except we're on the right-hand side, and that means that we're in row one or equation one, because we only have one. And then the second indexing says that we're in column one and column two, what? Or variable one and variable two. So we have one equation in two unknowns. And that's what it's telling us, this double indexing business. They're all just numbers. At first, you're like, what the heck is going on? A11 is a real number and a12 is a real number, and b1 is a real number. We just started indexing them because the systems are going to get more and more complicated. So those are real numbers. They're fixed. 2, 7, pi. That's what they're supposed to see. So when you're looking at those, stop seeing a11, see a 2. It's a number. It'll be fixed in the problem eventually. We're also going to assume that he's not 0 and he's not 0. Otherwise, we don't have an equation in two unknowns. Knowing that right out the gate, he could be anything. And that'll be our terminology eventually, called homogeneous or non-homogeneous. Just a second. Solving this. Classically now, we're going to say that if you get an equation at the bottom of a big system and you have two variables, you're going to make the higher index one the free variable. And then we're going to solve for the higher index one in terms of this one. If it was x and y, now we're reversing it. x is going to be dependent and y is going to be independent. So we should point out that that move is happening in linear algebra, the way we solve big systems, it's going to be that you want to call him the free variable. And this one depends on that free variable. What do I mean by that? I'm going to say that a12 is not 0. And a11 is not 0. And that gives me a11x1 is equal to b1 minus a12x2. Again, I'm reminding myself every time right before I move, this allows me to divide by whoever I want, either of these two guys, with impunity, because I know they're not zero because I checked. This now tells me that x1 is going to be negative a12 over a11x2 plus b1 over a11. And now that horribly, with all the indexing, is essentially what the other one was. But this says now we're going to say the 
there's my in lazy way of saying it. The lazy eight is my lazy way of saying infinitely many solutions. Infinitely many solutions are, we're going to start writing it like this. Now x2 is the free variable and x1 depends on x2. x1 is negative a12 over a11t plus b1 over a11 where t is any real number. And this is our general solution and there's infinitely many solutions because for every real number there's a point on that line which solves that equation. Now let's step it up and add as many variables as you want xn. There's still only going to be a one scenario, infinitely many solutions and you solve for the, uh, the, the highest index guys become free variables and you solve for the last guy in terms of all of those other guys. Let's do that. All right just so we can get the ball rolling and start talking about what this class is actually about, we want to talk about a system of linear equations which consists of n unknowns and m equations. And we're going to call it an m by n linear system. We're on our way towards that. Now we've talked about essentially one equation that had two unknowns in it and now just keep adding them. The scenario is going to be if you can't change the number of equations, what can you change in that? You can change the number of unknowns or variables that you have in that equation. Therefore, again, this is what it's going to look like in its most general form. You group all of those guys together, group all of these guys together, and so on. And classically, we put the constants on the right-hand side and all the variables on the left-hand side. This indexing now in Euler form is going to be... It's not Euler's form. I should clarify that has nothing to do with the Edmonton Euler form and the coloring. It has nothing to do with Euler, the mathematician. Possibly, but possibly not. We'll talk about Euler at some point. This equation, the orange, is going to denote the fact that we're in equation one, which right now we only have one ever, but we're going to get more equations soon. And then the blue indexing is going to tell us that we're in column for variable one, variable two, up to variable n. Once we have n variables, what's going to happen? Same thing. But classically now what we're going to do is just like with the x and the y, we're going to make x1 the dependent variable. And because a11 is non-zero, we solve for and move all of these to the other side of the equation and divide by A11 and we get this form of all of the solutions. That means that if we set now, don't worry about the indexing too much, but we're going to have n minus 1 free variables. xn will be the first free variable that we set up and then all the ways that we backtrack to calling these all t's, he's going to be tn minus 1. And that's going to give us t1 up to tn minus 1 are real numbers which are free to be anything. So these guys are free to be any real number you want. You can't lock that down. But once we have that, any ordered n tuple now, x1 up to xn, where I let the first x2 to xn be free to be anything, x1 will depend on those, and then that ordered n tuple will solve this original equation and be a solution. So again, we're going to get infinitely many solutions in this form. That probably is way too much to handle at first with too many indexing and notation. So let's do an example of one equation and three unknowns and what the solution looks like there. All right, we'll do an example now to clarify what we're saying here. Find the general solution to the equation 2x plus y minus 3z minus 5 equals 0. This isn't quite in the form that I gave. Classically, we move all the constants to the right-hand side, so let's do that quickly first. That should look like 2x plus y minus 3z equals 5. That's our equation. Then what am I saying? I have three unknowns. And then we're looking for solutions are going to be x, y, z ordered triples now, or n tuples in general when I have n of them. But now I'm looking for three numbers that are going to, when I simultaneously put them into this equation, will make the statement true. Easy ways of doing this and which will be useful. This is an equation of a plane in three space later on. And so what we're looking for is on that plane, any point in that plane will satisfy that equation. A good way to do that is how do I find points in a plane? We'll kill two of them. And now what does that say? Zero, zero, five over three will be a point on there. Zero, zero, five over three is a solution to this equation just by looking. Ah, and then what if I make these two zero? Oh, if I made those two zero, 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 what would y be? Five. That satisfies this equation. Try it out. 2 times 0 plus 5 minus 3 times 0 equals oh, 5. Check. It satisfies it. What we're looking for is all the solutions. And you can see I picked 2. 
And immediately your brain should say, oh, there's, he keeps saying one solution, no solution, infinitely many solutions. I just said it again. So I just found two. <laughs> so there can't be no solutions. There can't be one solution. So I think there's probably going to be infinitely many solutions. How do I find all of them and systematically list them? That's what we mean by general solution. But there's a really good way of finding certain points on a plane if you need them. Kill two of them, <laughs> and then you can solve for the third guy, because that's, what does that make that? That's why I know they're non-zero, because if x and y is zero, I have one equation and one unknown. And that's what elimination is going to do. We'll eliminate the other variables and then backtrack up. For now, put it back. What is this? 2x plus y minus 3z equals 5. Let's find all the solutions. What we're going to do is just what we said previously, but it's easier to see because we made it for simplicity x, y, z again. These are going to be the free ones. Solve for x in terms of those. So 2x equals 5 minus y plus 3z. Then I divide by 2 because he's non-zero. And that gives me x is 5 over 2 minus 1 half y plus 3 over 2 z. And there's all the fractions. I did it specifically so you could see there's the b1 over a11, etc. Now what we're going to do is we're going to say he's the highest index, but it's x, y, z. He's the last in the alphabet. Lexicographically, oh, word of the day. There's two words of the day. Lexicographically, what we're going to have is z is going to be a free variable. And for simplicity, where I'm going to use s and t and r usually, because hopefully they don't have some horrible system which has more than three unknowns or three free variables. You'll see later. And then he also has to be free to be anything because I can't narrow him down. I don't have enough information. So y is going to be another free variable, say s, and you can see I had three unknowns in one equation, this one. Uh -huh. So I'm going to have three minus one, which is two free variables, z and y in this case. And what that tells me is the general solution is going to have the form z is free to be anything, t say, call it, or that would be our t1 and t2 which is n minus 3 minus 1. I'll go back to S and T. And then y is free to also be any number, but not necessarily the same simultaneously, so he can be anything. But once those are fixed and you arbitrarily pick those guys, x has to depend on y and z. That says x is going to be 5 over 2 minus 1 half s plus 3 over 2 t, where s and t are any real numbers. And this is what we call the infinitely many solutions and the general solution to this one equation and three unknowns. Add more, you just get more free variables and this general solution is going to be a higher dimensional hyperplane in some n dimensional space. What? You'll see when we get there. Please subscribe right here, hit the notification bell. I'll see you next time.